Hello! Welcome to the Combo Club. I am your host, Camille Payne. And with me today, as always, is my co host, Amanda Coleman. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm doing all right. I'm having like a, a talking heads situation here. Like, what day is it? Where where is my beautiful wife? How did I how did I get here? Uh, <laughs> just kind of wandering around, not knowing what week it is. Uh, yeah, but otherwise, I'm I'm great. Okay, all right. Well, today we are talking X Men, the Uncanny X Men, the Dark Phoenix Saga. Uh, I, Amanda, there's no important comic book news that's happened this in, in the last couple of weeks, has it? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know about, I don't know what the weeks you're talking about are. Well, anything <laughs> that you can remember. Um, I remember hearing there was going to be a Spider-Verse sequel. Right, right. That sounds promising. I, I, I love the first Spider-Verse. So that's yeah. good. And apparently, um, they, they've more or less made it canon since we're talking about X-Men. They pretty much made it almost as close as they can to canon that like Wolverine, Gene, and, and Cyclops are in a three-way relationship. So that's uh, the thing. Wow, that's that's official now? <laughs> is, that from, is that from the Hoxpox uh, Hickman stuff? Yes, it is. Look, okay, so, okay, so let's, look, I, I'm going to give this about five minutes, all right, to, to explain this to people. Who all right, you're know. on the clock. Okay, so within... This story of, of House of X, Power of X. Was it Hot Spots? Is, is is that the name for it? There's people calling it Hot Spots. Um, I I have heard people use that unironically. So yeah. Okay, so Hickman has made a new status quo for the X Men, and basically they have their own nation now, and um it it which is um anchored by the island of Krakoa, which is the which is a living and mutant island that they first fought in Giant Size X Men number one. Back in 1974. This is now all the mutants home. Uh, everything is weird there, right? It, they've made up their own government. Made of various mutants. Which are weird. Go by um, seasons. So in the house of I think it's winter. I believe. I don't know. At, at one set of government. One set of these people sit at one table. Is Magneto. Apocalypse and Xavier. Another one is Gene Storm and Nightcrawler. Um, another one is Sebastian Shaw. Emma hey, Frost. don't skip leg day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sebastian Shaw, Emma Frost, and the member to be named later. And the other one has Mr. Sinister and some mutant that I'm not, never really heard of. That's not in my knowledge. Anyway. They said the best way to go for it is maybe to make more babies, which then cuts to what seems like was about to be a big um, Matrix-like orgy. Wow. And, and there's some weird looks between... You're, you're selling me this book. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> look, look, it's not quite an orgy. They don't get to that part, but it literally almost cut from Nightcrawler saying we should have more babies to like this party to where it's like Gene, Cyclops, and Wolverine looking at each other. Like in the weird embrace, then Gene going and giving Emma a beer. Like it's just look, there's a lot of subtext there. Then when all this is over with, we cut to the uh, first issue of of this new relaunch, right? And Hitman is very fond of his infographs, and, yeah, and stuff like that. So they have the infographs for House Summers. Which includes most of um, Cyclops' family and Wolverine, and it, and it shows each room and each dorm, right? If you look at the dorm that Cyclops, Wolverine, and Jeans, all three of those are connected to each other. None of the other ones are. Oh, okay. And Jean is in the middle, and Cyclops and uh, Wolverine are on each side of her, each with an entryway into her room. Hey, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Now again, it is not said out loud. It is not. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds pretty loud to me. <laughs> then Hitman did uh, write something back in July. I'm talking about well, a, a flock of cur well, a, a, a group of crows is a murder, and a group of mutants is an orgy. 
That's what Hitman wrote on his Twitter. So yeah. there's, a, there's some shit going on with his X-Men. There's some freaky, weird shit going on. And I'm just not talking about sexual either. <laughs> hey, I mean, they they had to do something different. And I know... Uh, I know that relationships are a big part of X-Men for a lot of the fans. Right, right. right. So throwing some fuel on that fire is not a bad choice, I think. It's just, man, it's just so weird, though. It's just, that that is almost like, that is almost canon that they just pretty much in a um, polyamorous relationship. That's just, but you know what, though? Well, a lot of shit that's new, I get mad. This... This feels almost, this feels right. This feels like this should have happened years ago. <laughs> Amanda, you there? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm there. I, I I don't really have a comment on the rightness of it, but... Uh... Look, them three been in this love triangle for so long. Look, they might well just have sex with each other at this point. Yeah. It's, okay, enough of that. All right, that was four and a half minutes. You still have 30 seconds. Uh, look, I'm done, okay? I am done. In fact, this show is done after talking about that. Goodbye, everybody. No, <laughs> I, I kid. I kid. Um, so, <laughs> trans, <laughs> uh, set went from orgies to epic space sagas. Today, we are talking X-Men, the Dark Phoenix Saga. This is a comic that ran from January 1980. To September 1980. It consists of nine issues. Issues 129 through 137. And the synopsis goes. One of their own members. Jean Grey. Has gained the power beyond all comprehension. And that power. Has corrupted her absolutely. Now they must decide. If the life of the woman they cherish. Is worth the existence of the entire universe. So Amanda. Yeah. Now just for me. This, and I guess for a lot of people, this is the greatest Marvel story ever told, period. I mean, all the Avengers bullshit, no. Greatest Marvel story ever told, in my opinion. Greatest X-Men story ever told. I, I love this story. It, it's been adapted many times. But Amanda, now that you've read this, what do you think of the Dark Phoenix Saga? I mean, it is, it is very, very good. I... Really, there's some really interesting ideas that come up sort of in, you know, moral terms and like how you define your own reality and how you define your relationships to other people. And there's like some very, very, very cool powers on display from like a lot of the characters, not just from Jean Grey. And it pulls in so many other aspects of the X-Men universe and the Marvel universe that you just sort of like, I don't want to say it's Easter eggy, but it's definitely like synthesizing a lot of pieces. Um, and that makes it exciting. Okay. So yeah, I think there there's, there's so much in this saga, in this, you know, arc, I, I'm like, I'm actually kind of frustrated that it was so short. You think nine issues is short? It's honestly two arcs. If you're, if, if we're, yeah. Look, oh, by the way, I should mention. Mm, excuse me. This is written by Chris Claremont. Chris, ah, Chris Claremont, who wrote X Men for 17 years. This is drawn by John Barn, one of the greatest artists of all time. And they pretty much co-plot this together as as um, artist and writer. And that's the is that the same John Byrne who did the Superman that we read? Yes, it is. And so, so, so absolute uh, absolute legends, uh, whether yes. we whether we think so or not. Oh, I think they are. That like like look, everything we know and love about X Men comes yeah. from Chris Claremont. Like like everything and and. To John Byrne, to to he left, right? Comes from these two men, especially Claremont, because he was on there damn near twenty years. So, like, 
to say that he's influential on X Men, it would be an understatement. He is X Men. Just yeah. Is. There's no way to cut it. You know what I'm saying? Like every like like almost everything we know about X Men come from Chris Claremont's mind. And like and like this is a duo. This the Dark Phoenix saga is is what um Jack <laughs> Stanley and Jack Kirby's like coming of Galactus is right. This is like this team's like greatest achievement together as yeah. a duo. Okay, so 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 you feel like it was short? Um, I just feel like they threw in so many ideas that these days a writer would have taken one of those ideas and stretched it out longer. Right. Um. I mean, like, you could take, for example, just, like, the whole thing with the Hellfire Club. That could have been going on for at least 12 issues on its own. Mm, okay. We could have gotten more Emma Frost. We could have gotten more, like, seduction of Jean Grey through period reenactment, I guess. Um, like, they're just... There could have been more. Well, to be fair, there's a there is a lot more before this. Not I don't think necessarily with um the Hellfire Club, but with, I think with the seduction of Jean Grey, there yeah. is more. Like like you know this pit like it's not like DC right where like DC like make like like just sits like its own like thing outside of the regular book. This took place within the book. Well, yeah, I understand that, but I'm I'm just saying that even the plot that we saw, right? These days, it would have been stretched out way longer. We uh -huh. would have had like like for example, there's a scene where they've met Kitty Pride for the first time, and they're at like literally a malt shop getting milkshakes to try and tell her that the X Men are great. That would have been like a whole issue of just like Kitty Pride hanging out with Storm if Ben wrote it, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know what? You're right. You are right. But I think this is better. Because it is weird, okay? Because you say it feels short. This, to me, felt really damn long. Mainly because there's a lot of damn words. Like, Clermont is very fond of his words and writing them. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, no, this is... It's very dense. I just think... I think that there's... There would... There's room... There's a, a big range in between... The decompression that we get in modern Marvel books sometimes and this super dense, like, so many ideas going on at the same time like that we have in this book. Like, they're just hidden, too, right? There's, like, one thing after another, right? There's, like, within... It's, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it's a little bit like what you were saying with Sandman, where you're like, any other writer could have taken one of those ideas and turned it into an entire book. And Guy Moon was just throwing out idea after idea, and there there were just so many of them that were good. <laughs> well, Claremont is the king of like long term storytelling, so like I could tell like an issue or two after this, Kitty does join the X Men, mm -hmm. and Dar and Dazzler gets her own book. Look, look within this like within this nine part epic, right? We get introduced to very two important mutants. Yeah. <laughs> Within the X Men mythos, this why it's not glanced over. <laughs> I I will say that surprised me. I did not expect that the Dark Phoenix saga was when we met Kitty Pride or Dazzler. <laughs> like I just didn't think that in the middle of the Dark Phoenix saga we were going to be meeting like new permanent X Men. Well, no, we actually meet three because Emma Frost has been a permanent fixture of the X Men yeah. for like the last what fourteen, fifteen years. Like, yeah, and and this is where she showed up. Yeah, so like there's a there's a and like I just said within Hot Spots, that's a stupid name. <laughs> you know, Emma Frost and Sebastian Shaw sits on the, the the small government council that Xavier has put on the island. So it's just it's weird how much mythology is tied up into these nine issues, right? It's just not this one book. It's it does so much. I, my love for this story knows no bounds. Now I have to admit, the first time I ever heard of this story was through the X Men's was through the X Men cartoon. Like most same, of and 
I know we'll talk about this um, this week next week, but the the creators of the cartoon felt the same way about this book as you do. <laughs> <laughs> I think, every, but this thing, I think everybody does. Like it's weird, man, because like we live in the age of Avengers, this Avengers that, right? There's almost no story in Avengers that's ever been this good, in my opinion. And I've read a lot of Avengers. There's nothing. Like, you know, like, like you know, we, uh, I guess the closest would be the, the Infinity Stone, like, like the Infinity Gauntlet story, but, you know, we, we reviewed that. We was kind of lukewarm on that, you know what I'm saying? But that was, as we know, anybody who... Well, it kinda, wasn't the best part of that if they brought some of the X-Men with them. <laughs> yeah. But it, it just shows you the quality and balance over the over the decades between like the writing of these two teams. <laughs> yeah. So, um I don't wanna go issue by issue. I just wanna to touch on a few things. I think another important thing that comes out this coming is like this is Wolverine's coming out party. Okay. Like issue thirty three of the X Men. Might be one of the greatest X Men issues ever. Like, like, and like, probably one of the greatest X Men. One, excuse me, probably one of the greatest like Wolverine stories that's been told. And this is, this is where Wolverine kind of comes into his own as like the character juggernaut and oversaturation that he will become in the future. It mm-hmm. starts in issue one thirty three, and that's the issue. If you don't know, is like when he's like. Basically making his way through the Hellfire Club like a video game from from the bottom level all the way up to the top level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's after he's fought, um, was it Leland, one of yeah. the Hellfire Club members who can, like, control gravity. He makes Wolverine so heavy that he falls through the floors of the building and into the sewer below. And they send some minions down there to confirm that they can find his body. And obviously they can't. And yeah, it is pretty badass how Wolverine fights his way back upstairs. He even has like the Clint Eastwood moment, like, do you feel lucky punk? Yeah. And he just completely scares the shit out of that last dude who just runs away. Yes. And like, I would be remiss if I didn't mention like in issue 132, the last scene is like, is this iconic scene of Wolverine like in the sewer saying it's my turn. Yeah. Like, which they actually replicate in the cartoon. Yes, yes, <laughs> that yes that that issue specifically, I was like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> what do you think of the Hellfire Club as villains? You know, I really love the idea that the X Men could be fighting villains who don't just have superpowers like them, but also like economic and social power that they could manipulate the story around what's going on. So. When the, you know, like when the X-Men fought the Hellfire Club, they called the, the Hellfire Club called the police and had sort of arranged it so that when the cops showed up, it would seem that the X-Men had just ambushed their party of wealthy, important people. And most of the people at the party would have perceived it that way, too. I mean, they were ready to be able to use that to bust out Sentinels, to go hunting mutants and like getting rid of the X-Men once and for all. And that that story thread just gets kind of um, dropped while they go finish dealing with Jean as the Phoenix. But, like, that's badass. That is, like, get inside your head and, like, you know, destroy your enemies mentally without actually literally being a psychic even. Right. Um, so I think I think that's the right type of villain for the X Men. What do you think about the way they dress? Um, I mean, everybody's got to have something. <laughs> look, because because like I got questions. <laughs> um, I mean, look, if I had quads like that, I would also wear leggings all the time. These men do not skip leg day. Well, here's the thing, right? So, like, a big part of this is like. You know, um, Gene having these, like, visions of the past, right? And everybody dressed in old-timey clothes. But that's kind of how the Hellfire Club dressed even in modern day. Yeah. Except for the women, apparently. <laughs> yeah, no, the, it is a little, um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I like how it's it's clear, you know, that Wingard's like, hey, Emma Frost is pretty hot, but you know it would be even better. Black leather and make her a redhead. I mean, uh, I, I mean, look, I... I wouldn't say he's wrong, but, <laughs> but yeah, it just mm. like there's clearly now look there, there's two ways to look at the way the women dress, right? It can be seen as through the male gaze of sexes, right? There's you you could you could say that easily, right? But I got another reading. There's clearly some like some dumb matrix like shit going on there, right? Oh, oh yeah, a little bit. There, there's clearly some like lick my boot slave shit type going on in the hair fire club. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, and 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 you're you're trying to claim this X Men orgy thing is new. No, this is this yeah. book has it's it's just a little it's just a little bit more subtle, but like, you know, the like the seduction of Jean Grey. Like, there's yeah, definitely an aspect of it which is like. Like, the phoenix is literally turned on by, like, destroying stuff. Well, no, let's talk about that. That's actually the thing I want. That's one of the main things I want to talk about with the book is, like, it's very, um, not not complicated, but, like, it's very, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? If, not advanced, but, like, it's, it's odd to have, like, these, like, complicated questions within the 80s comic book you know what i'm saying it seems very adult yes for like a a comic book you know what i'm saying like this idea of like her liking bad shit you know what i'm saying not just the destruction right just anything right she's at she's at the the the, the party in the dingy basement right and she's like oh i see like i'm getting images of all this vile stuff and it's turning me on. I think her exact words were it's turning me on. If yeah. If I'm not mistaken. So, like, there's this real, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, complicated, mature way is looking at just humans. I say, like, like through the through the guise of the phoenix. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, 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 like do, do that make any sense? Do, do, you know what I'm trying to say? No, I I think so. And it's also treated in a very, I want to say almost normal way. Like the characters don't seem uncomfortable talking about it. Right. Like, like as though they're familiar with this idea that like they all have powers above ordinary humans and they've all felt like that pull. Right. And that it's something that all of like, that it's just sort of known when you're an X-Men that like, sometimes you got to talk to your friends about how you were at the bank and you really wished you could have summoned like a typhoon to swipe everybody out of your way. So you could just get through the line faster and you didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one aspect, and like, this is, this is a lot of times an aspect when it comes to female characters and them quote unquote, like turning bad is like, there's like a sexual nature to it. You yeah, know? and there and there's ways to handle that. That's usually like really terrible. But I think for the most part, this book handles that type, that aspect, as well as it could. Yes. Am I off base here at all? Just no, no. It definitely. Um, I mean, there's sort of. Um, like a superficial level to it where it's like, oh yeah, we got the hot, powerful redhead in the black leather get up and, you know, it's super sexy. But the actual story doesn't lean into that in a way that gets gratuitous. Right. Right. Like I like I almost wish it had leaned into it a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> like like that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm getting into is like if this was a modern book, we would have gotten like way more of that and it would have been like a little more explicit and then that may also have left there that may also have left room for there to be more criticism of it right exactly but like i think and claremont has always been like this claremont believe it or not is very like good when it comes okay in my opinion the x-men women in general 
are the best mm-hmm. women in comics. Bar none. And a lot of that is because of Claremont. Most of that is because of Claremont. Claremont has always been good about writing women and writing strong women, in my opinion. So, like, like I have to give him a lot of credit for this, the way he handled just women in general. But definitely how he handled this aspect of, like, Jean Grey. As in, like, you know, of course there's a sexual element because the phoenix is, like, a creature of passion. But there's also this element of just power in general, right? Just, like, she's just, like, this all-consuming thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, so... And, like, it... It struck me how easy, like, Jason, like, got her to go. <laughs> With no questions. Like, that that's the more distressing part to me. <laughs> that, that, that there's no fight back on her end that she almost wanted to happen. That's well, how I read it. That's how so, it. yes. So she she did want it to happen at some level. Um, I wanted to point out this would be more like in contrast with the other adaptations. But um, something that this book specifically does is we get thought bubbles and then speech bubbles separately. Right. So we know a lot more about what the characters are thinking. And one of the things. Things I found very interesting was that Jean had her own personal explanation for what was happening to her, mm-hmm. which was that mastermind as, as Jason Wingard was making her see a sort of like Victorian romance to seduce her and convince her to come to the Hellfire Club. Jean believed that this was some sort of like past life trans or something she thought that she was actually living out like a life of one of her ancestors right and that this was something like within her some connection to herself that she was working through and because she had this belief that it was coming from herself she may have been more willing to go along with it like she wasn't stupid she was like oh like i'm having some weird psychic ancestral experience like I should engage with this and see what I learn about myself. Mm. And it's not really happening maybe, or it already happened. So it's not really like she was stupid and went along with it. It's like at some level, because in in some of, in, in like, in like the cartoon adaptation without that layer, it does seem like she's kind of stupid maybe. (laughs) No, you see, that's the thing. I never, thought she was stupid i just thought like jason whatever he was doing was like overpowering like wherever her thoughts were but okay so in a modern day comic right yeah the, the whole time she would have been fighting back some part of her mentally right they would they would have made that explicit that somehow she was fighting back to, be, because you know because there's always this fear of making the character unlikable right mm-hmm. that's not really here like yeah she had her own explanation but at the same time, it's this thing of like, like I said, if, if, if it was a modern day comic, it would have been more explicit that she was fighting back. Here, no, it's not. It's just like, the kind of the Phoenix does what the Phoenix wants. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> now, later, I could tell you they, they retconned that in the, in the worst way possible. But right now, Claremont and Burns seems doesn't seem afraid to show Jean in an unlikable light in some ways. Well, and that's the whole point of the story is like, if you've got someone that you love, how unlikable can they get before you try to kill them? (laughs) (laughs) And apparently if you're a nice enough, sexy enough redhead, you can destroy an entire solar system and your boyfriend's still okay with it. I mean, hey. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Both of your boyfriends are still okay with it. <laughs> Truly a story for the ages. Um, right, right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so. You know what? This saying, I got like two different dates because it was daylight saving times last night. And yeah. It, it's just throwing everything off. Because um, this has saying we've been recording for an hour and 31 minutes. 
<laughs> and I know it hasn't been that long, right? Time no, it hasn't been that long. Oh Lord, I'm having my own like time slips like Jean. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> quick, quick! What are you wearing? <laughs> oh no, I got buckles on my shoes. No. <laughs> And I'm in Sackles. That's right. It's 1647. I'm a slave. Shit. <laughs> oh, actually, maybe maybe we should mention that because yes! that's, yes! that's a, a part of the... Uh, I the, love that. I fucking love that. <laughs> talk about making characters unlikable. Um, in uh, the visions that Jean is having of Victorian old-timey romance, um once they've captured the X-Men and she looks at them, she actually sees Storm as like a slave and treats her like a slave. she's her slave. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, this makes sense. And I'm it's a smart so reader. And, and I'm like, but this is like, what? <laughs> but it makes sense, right? Like, like this Yeah, no, it sense. does. This is the thing, right? Because again, I don't think I don't think modern TV or modern comic books really did this. But if it would just avoided it entirely. Yeah, but like if you reverse engineer it, if he didn't do it, it would been it, it would have seemed kind of stupid. Yeah, and I guarantee that was Claremont's thoughts, right? Just like yeah. if I, <laughs> if he didn't make her like. Like I, I I I loved it. I not not that I love black people being slaves. That's not what I'm saying. But just like the logic behind it, I love that that you know what I'm saying that they didn't avoid it. That they went right at it. That they just tackled that aspect head on. That yes, if this was like 17, 16, 18 something, yeah, Storm would Storm would have been a slave. Well, and I think it was also, it was another way of showing, um, you know, like showing Gene being evil. Yeah, yeah. You Look, there's not much things more evil than a slave master, right? <laughs> Especially when it's really your friend. Yeah. And so, you know, that's something that Storm, and you talked about Claremont writing strong women, you know, the the women in these books talk about each other like oh like she's like my sister and, I and love her. yeah and I love her and for Storm Aurora to have to like face like oh this woman I love she's like family to me and this is how she's seeing me right now and she's going along with it and I have to know that that's like inside her at some level right I mean that's that's again. That could be an entire issue, and it was like two panels. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it wouldn't be an entire issue because they would just avoid it in modern day comic books. Yeah, that too. Especially now, Marvel that's owned by Disney ain't no ain't no in the hell they would touch that with a ten foot pole. I guess the other aspect we should talk about is the love story. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the love story in this? Um. I mean, all right, let's just get this out of the way. Um, Cyclops is usually kind of a nerd. Um, He seemed pretty cool in this, though. Cyclops is always cool. I'm so tired of people saying he seemed kind of like a nerd. The the X-Men cartoon, for as much as we love it, has done more damage to that character than it ever did good. He, He just, Cyclops always just feels a little bit, too much like like a lawful good overachiever mm. I mean to an extent that it is true it's weird okay so like I've been rereading old X-Men comics right yes and I think this is where like we have a disadvantage from just from not like reading X-Men comics from like the beginning but like uh, Jack has a different view of Cyclops than we do all together okay because cause in his point of view, because, like, okay, from my point of view, he's like a Captain America type, right? Like, yes. Like, you know what I'm saying, kind of stuff, he's kind of uptight. And that, and that's there, I'm not saying it's not, but also, Scott is defined by his tragedies, which is something we don't get a lot, you know what I'm saying, in modern-day X-Men, in my opinion, right? Or, like, 
since we watched the cartoon, a lot of that is not there within that. You know what I'm saying? Like, Cable shows up in, in the X-Men cartoon. It's never said that he's Cyclops' son that was kidnapped, right? Right. You know, you know they don't talk, like, in the cartoon, they don't talk about the loss of his mother or the fact that his dad is a fucking space pirate. That, that right there is, is like... <laughs> Yeah, no, that that barely comes up. And it's like, it isn't like, oh, like your dad left. It's like, oh, hey, cool, your dad's a space pirate. Yeah, like, but like in the comic, it gets into the fact that, you know, his dad was kidnapped and his mother was killed and all this. So, like, from my, so, like, we're coming from a disadvantage when it comes to Cyclops. I think they've done a better job lately since he's, since, like, for a few years he went full mutant terrorist. Which is a very which would make him very interesting. Yeah, but you're not wrong, but I think we have an incomplete picture of Mr. Scott Summers since we're just a bit young. Like this book came out in 1980, we weren't born yet. Right. <laughs> I just I guess I just kind of inherently don't trust people who want to be in charge, and Cyclops seems like he wants to be a leader. Well, you know what though, that that actually that's actually part of the writing too. Like, you know, Claremont, you know, is, is, is like at the time a newer writer, but like he's very much working within the tropes of like when you're the leader, you have to be like a 40 year old man, even if you're like 19. Yeah. And, and Cyclops is what, 19, 20 years old? But he talks yeah, like, no, these these people feel like they have mortgages and <laughs> none of these characters. It, I, I was going to say, I thought that was funny that they were. Uh, he referred to them in the narration as young people several times. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but no, they all are. They are all like, they're not even in a mid storm, maybe in her mid twenties. I think storm may be, well, technically Wolverine is the oldest, but I'm just saying with, with the exception of Wolverine, I think storm is, is supposed to be a little bit older than everybody yeah. else, but you really can't tell. Like, because they all seem like, oh, they all seem like, now, he gets better with this, but I'm telling like, his earlier stories with them. Yeah. It is far more pronounced. It is far more pronounced. It's like the story version of when artists draw children as just, like, smaller adults. Yeah. So, like, but, like, like, he's been doing the book about, what, like, four, about six years now, I think, about, about, about four or five years now. So he's actually toned down on the, like, Cyclops as, like, a 40-year-old man um, tone. Because, like I said, in the earlier books, it was way worse. He was just yelling at people constantly. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, yeah, Cyclops do seem pretty cool in this. He's he's a man very torn. Um, yeah, and he's... Yeah, he's been he's been through so much with Gene and it is it does feel really good to watch them grow closer over the course of the story. Right. Um I found it interesting that earlier in the story um there's this I mean, not to go back to the orgy thing, but um, <laughs> like when when they are in the club to meet Dazzler and Jean kisses Mastermind as as Jason, um, Scott's reaction is like, wow, she's just like really going for it. Not like, you know, incense, jealousy and rage and like dragging her out of there like we need to talk about this right now. And then when they um, when they visit Angel yeah, at yeah, his that mansion, was, that was and weird. he gives her like a real kiss hello, he's just like, okay, this is fine. And Angel's girlfriend is like, hey, like, don't get too carried away. I might start getting jealous. And I'm like, we all just hook up with each other, huh? I, just, um, I mean, let me ask you a real world question. If a woman kissed your husband like that, how would you feel? If I had to watch, yeah. I'd be like, I'd be like, uh, this is a little, I, I would be, I would be like very, I would be very like, we need to remove ourselves from this situation right now and like discuss this. Like, I don't care if the universe is ending. I don't care if like 
you're embarrassed in front of your mutant friends. Like, we need to have a, like, I don't know what's going on. If if I wasn't seeing it and I was just finding out about it later, I might be, like, a little bit more. But I don't think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, like, she hops off the weird, oddly phallic airplane and runs, like, yeah, no. Oh, Warren, I haven't seen you so long. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, they- and... and- and like her, and like her boyfriend is right there, and I was just a uh, little, okay, cool. Like, like, okay, I guess. So, so I'm not tripping, right? Because I thought Starclaw's reaction to both of these was kind of subdued to I think how real people would act. I mean, I think I think they've got some sort of understanding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or 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 perhaps what's going on here is that they've had like a more casual relationship, and that this. Dark Phoenix saga is the solidifying of like them having like a real intense emotional right. even literally psychic rapport that they didn't have at the beginning. Mm, okay. Okay. Like maybe maybe this is like seeing them solidify as a couple. Um cuz I know that's a good way of looking at it. I've never thought about it like that. Yeah, cuz like I I also know that um Dating was a little different in previous generations. Like some, I've I've heard that apparently dating was a little more casual back in the fifties or sixties compared to what we think from watching television. Mm. Um, but anyways, um, <laughs> yeah. No, I just I just thought their reactions were a little bit. Um, not output. Output is the wrong word, but it's just like, oh well, that's a thing, I guess. Like she just making it, out with this weird dude in the middle of the club. What it really was that was surprising was it, it's this whole thing of like that one panel would become a whole story. It is it's so refreshing actually to see a to see like a romance or a drama or something, and to see like oh she kissed another dude and like the rest of the story isn't about that. Right. Because we're like, we're so primed to expect that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's weird too, cause immediately afterwards, huh? Cyclops have sex and, and, and developed the cycle report. What? Maybe like an hour after that within story time, it yeah. seems. So yeah, a lot of, and she shows up with a picnic basket and like yeah i you know yeah she shows up with a picnic basket and she's just like all right angel you got to take off i need a little time here anyway, like they're just like very open about it by the way if, if there's not one character more born than angel i don't know who it is like to be an original it's me there's one boring ass character the best <laughs> thing that ever happened to him was turn blue and get metal wings i swear <laughs> You know what else I find odd too? That like when they're fighting for Gene, right? All, Which time they fight for Gene a lot? Well, uh, at the end when they're fighting on the blue side of the moon, right? Okay. All the original X Men there except for Ice Man. Like I wonder what was going on with Ice Man that on why he wasn't there because it makes sense to me that if you got because like the original X Men is Cyclops, Beast, Gene. Angel and Iceman, right? So you have almost everybody there but Iceman. So all these people have like these personal relationships with like Gene, right? And they play on this history because because you know we get to see a lot of these people thoughts. Yeah. I wonder why Bobby Drake wasn't there because it wouldn't because it would be a nice booking if they was gonna kill this character off to have all her original teammates there instead of just most. Oh, and it would have been great for the cover too. Right. So, but yeah, so, let me see, what else What else should we talk about? Um, isn't it weird to you how X-Men can go from, like, an allegory about race, about, about discrimination to, like, giant space opera within the scan of, like, <laughs> a blink of an eye? Yes. Um, yeah, I... Yes, um, that was one of the pieces that I was alluding to when I said that this brought in like other parts of the Marvel universe. Like I love 
when Lalandra shows up and she's just like, oh, what is like my human boyfriend messing around with psychics again and I've got to clean up his mess? Like, I'm going to I'm going to call the Kree and the Skrulls and I'm going to have like a space gladiator fight. <laughs> um, I just kind of I really I also really like um, uh, Lalandra's design, like the weird hair thing. I think they're supposed to be like bird people. I believe. I believe they're supposed to be like bird people. So I I don't know, but that might have to be my Halloween costume for next year. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, so that fight at the end, right? Yes. Didn't it feel doomed from the beginning? Didn't it feel like a like uh like Magnificent Seven or like like Magnificent Seven type of thing where like, of course they're gonna lose. And, and and lose like soundly. I mean, it was definitely setting it up for. I was like, okay, this is an X Men book. Like, they're not gonna like lose, lose. But it was definitely setting it up for like they did not have the ingredients to ensure their own success. It was going to have to be some Deuce Ex Machina, some some element that we weren't actually aware of just from reading the story was going to have to show up and fix it. Or but, but it didn't. They just lost. No. Like Gene, it, it, like they just lost. But like, yep. like it's weird because because like when like and and this is my first time with the feeling of this because it's been a few years since I've read it. We're like, oh, this just feels doomed from the get go. Like you know what I'm saying? When they get there, yeah. there seem like there's no hope for them to ever win and save Gene. And there wasn't there. Like like not only do they lose, they lose soundly. Yeah. And they lose quickly. They lose soundly. And they- uh-huh. And they also went into it not even sure if they were right. Right. They were like, we're not even sure if fighting is the right thing, but we love Gene, so we're going to do it. And then they just get their asses handed to them. Yeah, it's a it's a tough it's a tough ending. It is. It is. And and like, what do you think of the ending? Oh, I I love it. I think it's very. Um, you know, it's very, you can't always have everything you want. Right. And Scott did get sort of a little bit of, a little bit of closure with Jean. Like, he did get some time with her again. Right. Um, no, I, I think it was, I think it was a bold, like I said, you're expecting something to come in at the last minute. And it doesn't. And that plays, that plays with you just like. You know, when you see your girlfriend kissing another dude and you're just like, oh, yeah, that's fine. We're not even going to make a thing out of it. Um, <laughs> it just kind of subverts expectations a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. What did you think? It's weird, man. They, I, I just, they've been setting up this Wolverine and Gene thing for so damn long. Like, just, we're talking decades of this. And mm-hmm. it's weird how they don't even get into it. Wolverine just say stuff like, I love her, and I can't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, yeah. I can't do it. So, so, so Colossus, you're going to have to do it. Like, I, I do think that's a really powerful scene when they outside of Jean's house, and Wolverine couldn't murder her. Like, like, yes. like she snapped back, and he was just like, oh, shit. And, he, and like, the, the, the killing machine is caught off guard, guard, which doesn't happen much in this book. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about Wolverine just killing indiscriminately? Um, I mean, I, I kind of prefer my, my Wolverine. So, okay. So here's the thing. One of the things I like about Wolverine is the sort of like, like the Han Solo thing. Like he's a ruffian, but like deep down, he's like a good guy. Right. But in order for him to be a ruffian and deep down a good guy, like, he does have to mess stuff up. Like, like, he does need to be capable of that. And so seeing him, like, just smash is great. (laughs) (laughs) Again, like I said, this is Wolverine's coming out part. This is when people decided Wolverine was the coolest character in the X-Men. (laughs) <laughs> Scott was too busy watching his girlfriend make out with other dudes. We moved on to Wolverine. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, like the 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 rug. Like, I'm honest with you, I love Scott, but he's never been the coolest. Man, 
There's at least five or six S men that I would put above Scott. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and they mostly on that team. Also, this lineup. What, what do you think of this lineup of X Men? Like now, I'm just asking you general questions. I think I think we all enjoy the story. So now I'm just asking you general questions, padding out the time a bit. What what do you think of this lineup? This is like a classic lineup. Um. So since most of my exposure to X Men is like the cartoons and the movies, um, which obviously all the cartoons and movies were very strongly inspired by this. This is a familiar lineup to me, so I um, I like it. Uh, I um, I feel like I don't know. I feel like the I feel like they are missing somebody with like a more visually interesting fighting style. Mm, okay. Like I think maybe that's something that like Iceman would have brought. Right. Is you know, that we've got a lot of people who punch things and we've got like some ladies that float around and can kind of like blow things around. But like we didn't have anybody with like a good like energy blast besides Phoenix. Mm, okay. So so visually I feel like they may have been able to compose a more interesting team, but um personality wise it felt really familiar and really really good. What about you? I, I'm I'm it makes me sad that we don't get more Colossus and Nightcrawler in the cartoons or movies. Mm. Cause yeah. like, those are like two of my favorite and honestly Beast to a certain extent, even though Beast has been in the last like last five X Men movies. But like you know, it makes me sad that we don't get more night crawling colossus in the movies because those are two vi- vi- like visually interesting and just great characters in general. Yes. To not have. Also, they pretty much set up because again, Clarman is the king of this, right? They pretty much set up the kitty and like colossus, like yeah, love affair immediately. But it's weird because she's like thirteen and he's like eighteen. And I, they, they technically they still teenagers, but that's like a wide gap at that age, I guess. Like, yeah. <laughs> but times were different, right? Times were slightly different, but yeah, they almost it, yeah, but yeah, they set that up immediately. Uh, but yeah, that's like I like this lineup. I don't think it's. I think it has all the essential X Men in there, right? They, they have all the essential X Men, except except they're in the wrong costumes because I'm a child of the '90s. And I prefer like the '90s costumes, like you know, you know, Cyclops with a hood. Mm. Mm. Ah. I I I I really like this um this outfit for Storm though. Yeah, I do too. But mm, yeah. okay, it's my second favorite outfit. <laughs> Which one do you? Which one's your favorite? Of course, the nineties one, the, the all white. Yeah, okay. Yeah, of okay. course. Yeah. But th- this is a close second. I mean, she doesn't have much clothes, but you know that's not necessarily determined for me. I'm I'm surprised you like it as much. Um. Because it's basically a bathing suit with thigh high boots. Yes. <laughs> but and the <a> cape. <laughs> yeah, there's a cape. Um. I mean, I think this goes back to. Uh, what you were saying about we get to see women be strong and a little bit sexy without it being like overly titillating or overly male gazy. Right. Like you, we get, we get a couple of shots where storm looks really nice. And then like most of the time she's just drawn normally like the other, like the other guys. Um, and I think it's kind of a cool costume. Like I think the cutouts look cool. I think the Cape is cool. You know, she's always had that unique Kate was like attached at her wrist. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, you know, there's always been like a unique aspect to Storm is that that cool. Like, um, in in recent time, they've kind of like upgraded that suit where it does have pants. So it's like a, like like her, her the suit she has now is a mixture between the '90s suit and this suit. And 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 it looks and it looks really good. But um, jean costume is terrible. I don't, I've. <laughs> Um, which um, one? Which 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 one? Uh, well, clearly, I'm not talking about the little one. No, I take that back. It's not terrible. It's just okay. Well, well, let's go go over what we see her wearing. We see her wearing a lot of street clothes. Right. We see her wearing the green 
version of the Phoenix outfit. And the red version. And the red version. Well, and uh, the the um Black Queen outfit and eventually yeah. her Marvel Girl outfit. The problem yeah. with Jean, and this is always, and I guess we should talk about the main character in this book, period. But, like, the problem with Jean is none of her costumes are never click with me until the 90s cartoon. Until the 90s costume. And honestly, the 90s costume, out of all of them, she might objectively have the worst one. But at least it looks uniform. Like, so, th- so the weird thing about X-Men is none of their costumes match, but they all look like they, they belong in a set, except for hers. Hers always yeah. seems off for some reason. You know what I'm saying? Like, like everybody else seems like they go together, right? It's Colossus, Nightcrawler, Storm, Wolverine, Cyclops. All their costumes look like they're made by the same person. Yeah. Even though they look nothing alike, per se. But Jean costumes were, like I said, they're terrible. They're not terrible, but they always been off for me. It, like, like, like she's almost not part of the group. Does that make any sense? Um. Yes. Yes. I definitely, because I remember, like, watching the opening of the cartoon and being like, what? Because they, they each come up with their name. Uh-huh. And I was just like, what? <laughs> Who is she? <laughs> Jean Grey, what yeah, is she, she doing here? Like she don't even have a code name. Like she technically have a code name, but it's Marvel Girl, and and that's silly when you like a twenty eight year old woman. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's another thing too about the S Men. Like like S Men relationship to Marvel is weird because like Marvel Girl is a good name, and you honestly just could name her Marvel Woman, right? Mm-hmm. But it's almost like. They purposely put the S Men off in their own universe, away from the, from the rest of Marvel. Like almost, they don't want them to be associated with each other, even though Beast is an Avenger. Yeah. But like you know, they like the rest of the Marvel universe cross over, cross over with each other constantly, but not really the X Men. The X Men. I mean, always... I. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I feel like the X-Men stuff may just be too complicated for everyone to keep track of. Well, yeah, there is that. There is definitely that. Also, Beast. Beast's personality is weird. Because apparently, from what I've been told, Beast used to be like a fun-loving like party character. And I'm just like, that. that's weird. And apparently that was his... Um, that's kind of was like his default character until like the 90s almost. When they decided be- they needed a professor character. Yes, yes, basically. So, like, you know, this beast is a little different than the beast that we know. Yeah. All right. So. Yes, he was very excited about the green alien woman who was going to give him a massage before the battle. <laughs> when you be? <laughs> hey, why not? I know, right? We know, I mean, we, we know he's got a thing for ladies with green hair, too. We do know that. We absolutely know that. Yeah, so... But yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think we've covered everything. I think that's it. I think, yeah, that, that, I think we're going to have, I think we're going to end up coming back to this a lot when we're talking about the adaptations because yes. just in a vacuum, it's like, yeah, this is a legendary story. What else is there to say about it? Besides everyone should absolutely read it. It's only nine issues. And again, like I love old comic books because everything is set to be six issues. So, so they can make a trade out of it. I love that this story is just nine issues. Like, like it had no like even number. They, <coughs> oh, excuse me again. They wasn't even thinking about putting it, this shit into a trade. It was just something that happened in the comic. So it could be as many issues. If he wanted it to be twenty issues, it could have been. Yeah. You know, just an odd number of comics. But yeah, so. So Amanda, I, so would you recommend this story? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I would recommend it to anyone who wants to read any X Men comics at all. Well, okay, so let me ask you one last question: Have you read a lot of X Men comics? Maybe? I haven't read a lot of X Men. Do I read? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I was I was gonna say I've read some stuff here and there. Um, usually there will be if like I feel like if there's like a free comic book day thing or like a promotional thing that gets me into it for a few issues, and I own. Um, 
uh, Whedon's Astonishing and some of the other stuff that came out around then. Okay. Which we'll, which we'll probably get to. Like, um, whenever we do that, we'll probably have to do that whole run. That might be that might have to be like a whole month. That might have to be over two episodes because Whedon Run is really good. But yeah. like, my question is, so, but is this is your first time reading Classic Hits, man? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Does this fits into your mind of what you think about it's me um yeah definitely okay it, it feels if, if this is the most x many thing i've ever x-men <laughs> <laughs> it puts the the x in the x-men x marks the spot i don't know this feels very um i mean this feels like the core that everyone else has been trying to mine for their adaptations like, right. the underlying truth of what the X-Men are supposed to be. Because, like, I know for some people who, even people who love the X-Men, sometimes, believe it or not, they haven't read the Claremont run. They actually start with the 90s stuff, which is, you know, mostly terrible. So that's that's why I was asking, does this feel like, like, you know, what you think of the X-Men? Because I know for some people, it doesn't necessarily does. Like, Professor X is really weird in this. Yeah. You know, we didn't even talk... <laughs> Professor X, right? Yeah. Now, we know Professor X as Patrick Stewart. And, and like, honestly, even before Patrick Stewart played the role, like, by the late 80s, early 90s, he has... he, he He's kind of become, like, the more subdued character that we know, the all-wise, all-knowing character that we think of Professor X. Right. This Professor S is not that at all. He screams and he yells, and it's yeah. really and it's really off putting to see Professor S that way. Yeah, I think that's a little bit more realistic though. Is like the the unstable genius, right? And that also makes for much more interesting stories. Um, you know, we don't. Characters who arrive already knowing everything and already having everything figured out can be interesting in like small doses, but it's, I mean, the, the, the unstable genius aspect of it fits way more into this whole vibe of like, you know, that these are X-Men who've had to think about, like I said before, using their powers on people out in public at the bank or, you know, who've just who've actually really lived right um the patrick stewart professor xavier definitely feels way more like a movie character than just some i don't know okay also let's be real if you were a powerful psychic could you really be a nice person if you like actually knew what people were thinking all the time and how they were such tremendous assholes like you wouldn't be that nice and calm Oh, no, no, no. You would not still have that much love for humanity. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> okay. So, Amanda, <laughs> yeah, because, man, could you imagine Professor S exists in a time where Trump is president? Oh, man. He'll he'll just give us all aneurysms. We'll all just be dead. Like, he'll be like, you know what, Matt Nito, you are right. I'm sorry for doubting you. My bad. <laughs> yeah. So, Amanda, um, what are we doing next week? We're actually doing three episodes um, this this month. So, what are we doing next week? Well, next week we're talking about adaptations of this story, right? Yes, we are. This story is so influential that there's been many that there's been so many adaptations of this story that I actually had to cut it down some. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There, there's versions of this story, or there's versions of where, like, or maybe not this story, or where the Phoenix show up, that I just actually just had to cut it down to, like, the three main ones, which are the animated series. Yes. S-Man 3. I'm, I'm sorry for everybody that has to watch that. And the Dark Phoenix movie. Again, sorry. I'm sorry that you have to watch that. So... <laughs> And it'll be so interesting to talk about why this comic book version could be considered legendary and is a really great read versus how those movies have been sort of universally panned. Right, right. So look forward to that next week. Now, Amanda, what are we doing the week after that? What are we reading? 
Um, we are Squadron maybe so. looking at we are maybe looking at Squadron Supreme. Okay. Um, I got a tip from a comic book writer while I was in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Um, so we will maybe try to get that. Okay. Going. So, Did you have a backup you wanted to toss out? Yes. Okay. So, like, I've never read the original Squadron Supreme. I'm actually more. So, this is what we'll do. If, if we don't do Squadron Supreme with your comic book writer friend, yeah, we can hold off to that to next year, if if possible. Mm-hmm. So, so we can't get him in a couple of weeks. We'll be, actually be reading the Martin Day reboot of it, Supreme Power. Okay. Which should be an interesting um, read. Because that's the version I'm more familiar with and I think it's really good. It's written by, um, how, how do you say, J, was it J. Michael Krasinski? Oh, it? yeah. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy. We love that guy. We do love that guy. Of uh, Spider Man Babylon 5 fame. He's, he's, he's famous equally for being a TV writer and a comic book writer. Also, he used to write episodes of the real Ghostbusters. So Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, you're I'm like, who I'm cares really, about I'm who like, cares about Babylon Five, man? <laughs> Nobody. I've never known. X Men? Who are they? Ghostbusters on the other hand. <laughs> so look, if, if we can't get him so we're either read which is okay, is this confusing? If we can get your friend on who we won't say the name of right now, we'll be reading Squadron Supreme. If we can't get them on for this year, we'll we'll be reading Supreme Power. Yeah. So just read both. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a supreme a supreme show no matter what. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. It's the best I can do in this in this uh, talking heads life I'm living right now. All right. So that's that is it this week. We will see you next week for the Dark Phoenix Saga adaptation episodes. I'm Jamil Payne. I'm Amanda Comey. And we are out.